All right, this is the history of robotics for the Nicolay Robotics course materials. What you will learn, we are going to cover today the key events that lead to the invention of the modern robot, as well as the evolution of the modern robot through history, and what key components are going to lead up to that. Um, and how we can hopefully start to project what's going to happen in the future. So, robotics, where to begin? Well, the first robot, um, we have to kind of set up a timeline. The timeline contains only a few events that occur before the Common Era, or BCE. Um, but one of the main things that we should talk about is the fact that the abacus, which many of you uh, may have noted, is the device that uses beads to help uh, an individual keep track of numbers and make larger calculations, um, was an invention that definitely helped uh, progress mankind forward, and it re represents the first attempts to conquer complex math. Um, two other major events in the BCE section um, of our timeline uh, have to do with the invention of a wooden pigeon um, that can fly under steam or compressed air power and this allowed us to start to talk about pneumatics. Um, Architects of uh, Teratones, um, it was his flying pigeon that acted as a spark to get the thinkers of that time starting to explore and look at steam and compressed air and how they worked and why it worked and how it could be used. Um, so we have a diagram there of the flying pigeon. Um, and this study started to look at pneumatic power and how it could be widely used in that time. And it's still very much widely used today, as you can see with that modern robot um, as an actuating system as a part of the uh, end of arm tooling or EOT movement system. Now, looking at Hero's engine and more. So this is just after um, the common era began, so the CE. Um, and we're not quite sure because there's not a lot of uh, historical data um, left behind because, well, it was over 2,000 years ago. Um, but Huron of Alexandria created uh, what was known as uh, Huron of Alexandria's engine, um, or Hero's engine uh, for short. Um, but he created steam engine design, which emerged shortly after that, the beginning of the common era. Um, we're not quite sure when he got it down, but we find that it's the first steam engine that was designed and this can, you know, was added to uh, basically the arsenal of engineers at the time as a way of, or early inventors, as a way of advancing pneumatic systems, um, which is outlined there in the diagram on how that system worked. Um, this system was also employed by Huron to um, create uh, automata. Um, which are devices that work under their own power and are often designed to mimic people. So if you look at um, the diagram there, that's a, an example where you have a water source that's pushing water and moving fluid power, pneumatic power, hydraulic power, um, and those systems to create movement. Um, you have those tubes and pressures that are created which allow different actions to take place um, seemingly by themselves. So let's jump forward a little bit. Um, Leonardo da Vinci uh, took the automata to the next level um, with his armor system. Um, so around 1495, Leonardo da Vinci created the metal plated warrior. Um, you'll see an example right there on your screen. And then the innards um, with regards to the gears and pulleys and systems that were used to man maneuver um, the system. The system. Um, 
The suit of armor was able to sit up, move its arms, move its head, raise its visor via those pulleys and gears. Um, this invention created to entertain Da Vinci's dinner guests um, inspired Automata that followed and was definitely ahead of its day in terms of the engineering genius that Leonardo da Vinci possessed. Um, in the 1500s also, we have um, Per Ambrose. He published an idea for an artificial hand using mechanical muscles um, along with organic components. Ambrose's approach was basically to create the first prosthetic or artificial replacement that closely resembled the lost hand of an individual and function instead of using something fashioned out of wood like a hook um, that was you know, attached to an individual. So a prosthetic is an artificial replacement for a missing or damaged organic part, and he wished to replace that with uh, a similar form and function just mechanically. Now, here we go with understanding that robotics has to do with a lot of different STEM concepts and math being a large concept. During the 1600s, uh, William uh, Outred gave us the slide rule, um, which is a device for quickly looking up complex calculations and which proved to be a tremendous time saver for engineering of the day. And in fact, this system lasted um, for over 400 years, well into the mid to late uh, 20th century, um, until we created the scientific calculator, which we'll talk about in a little while here. Um, at the same time, uh, Wilhelm uh, Schickard and Basil Pascal um, built, you know, they built a computer, um, which was really quite amazing, um, considering that most people would say that the computer has only been around for about 30, 40 years. Um, if they're really smart, you know, maybe till the, in the, you know, the 1920s. Um, However, really it was invented in the 1600s. Um, that, that, that computer was basically a glorified calculator, but this calculator could add, subtract, multiply, divide um, using just a gearing system. Um, and so it could display numbers as well. So this invention created computation systems which allowed for greater mathematical capability. Um, and these systems, um, you know, created control opportunities that weren't um, there before. At the same time, speaking of control, um, Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz um, rounded out uh, the 1500s or the 16, you know, the 1600s, excuse me, with um, the development in 1679 of what we would now call binary code for digital computers. He completed that process um, in 1679, and that is, of course, something that we still power our digital systems um, now. Moving forward, um, we have a couple of really cool uh, inventors and engineers who created an opportunity or created systems that. Um, even today would be considered pretty unique. Uh, uh, Jacques de Vacanson created the clockwork autom automaton or self-operated machines. Um, so in his case, his biggest piece was the digesting duck, um, which you have a illustration and then a reconstruction on the screen. Um, his digesting duck could walk, quack, um, at eight, and he even allowed it to expel waste, um, even though that waste was preloaded. Um, the duck itself did not actually digest the food that it ate. Um, onlookers were absolutely amazed and thought that he had created um, life in some cases to the uneducated, um, kind of a, a Frankenstein type of experience. And Frederick von Naus uh, created. Um, from Vienna, created a machine capable of writing um, with input from the user uh, predetermined sentences, um, or it could be used as a typewriter that when keyed manually, but it would come out as handwritten 
um, letters. So it was very intricate and well developed and a um, reconstruction is shown on the screen um, where it appeared that a statuette was doing the writing. It was actually the ma machine down below that was not revealed to the users or to the onlookers. Now this is really quite amazing. In 1804, Joseph uh, Marie Jacquard um, created something that was used for quite some time. Um, he created the punch card control system, which was used for mechanical loom, um, which you can see off to the side there for textile creation for fabrics. Um, and it used the coding system, which you can see on the screen, um, held together there to basically program the loom to make certain um, movements. And you can see the off to the side of the loom there, the long um, pre-recorded uh, punch cards that were fed through the loom to help control um, the way that the loom operated. Um, these holes, which were punched into metal or wooden rectangles, were called cards to control the timing and flow of the actions and its operation. Um, but what's really more importantly, the, this punch con card control system was widely used for almost all machine controls until the late 1970s up to the early 1980s, um, when later computer numerical control systems were employed. Um, but if you really think about it, that means that for over 200 years, we were using the card control system, um, you know, obviously improved upon, uh, but this card control system went on until we had digital um, go to source machine control opportunities. Now let's jump up, jump up here. Um, so let's jump ahead almost uh, over 100 years, and we have to talk about a couple of things. First, um, the concept of the robot as we know it. Um, well, we get to the 1900s, and we have the digital age, and modern robotics are, are going to be born here. And we have uh, Carl Kapik in 1921. Um, he was a Czech writer and science fiction. And so we're in the 20th century, and this is the beginning of what we would call modern robotics and uh, technological devices. And so he was captivated by these systems, and he wrote about what he would call um, robots, which come from uh, his native language of Czech, um, robota, which means drudgery or slave-like labor. And then Isaac uh, Asimov in 1940, um, he gave the world the three laws of robotics through his science fiction um, writing. And these robotics, uh, in the robotics realm, many people still hold true today that these laws are the outline for how robots and humans need to work together. So as a side note, we have the three laws of robotics, um, and these laws will be utilized throughout our coursework. So we need to hold true to uh, these laws. In the first law, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. So your robot should definitely not harm me or you or anybody else um, or through its inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Uh, second law, a robot must obey orders given to it by human beings except when such orders would conflict with the first law. So your robot should be intelligent enough not to damage uh, a human being. Um, and then, of course, uh, the third law, a robot must protect its own existence as long as, it, as such protection does not conflict with laws one and two. All right, machines are alive. Someday. Uh, War McCulloch and Walt Pitts in 1943, uh, they published a paper laying out basically the groundwork for artificial intelligence using software and hardware that is capable of processing data um, similar to human thought 
giving it the ability to deal with questions that w where there are no clear right answers or multiple answers would work as well as ultimately intuitive jumps to problem solving. So these gentlemen in 1943 uh, created artificial intelligence and laid out that section of the technological world. Um, so those were some huge leaps in, you know, understanding and mathematically divide, de devising the principles for how um, AI systems would develop into the future. And these, uh, their bedrock principles have still held up um, through today. Now, we have a big year coming up with regards to the history of robotics and our technological systems of today. Um, and that is 1958. It's a big year because Jack Kilby creates and develops the first microchip and Vanuku Corp uh, ships the first numerically controlled machine. Um, these two pieces of technology allow for us to start really revolutionizing control systems. Um, obviously with the smaller microchip and integrated circuit, um, we're allowed to uh, make things much tinier using Boolean algebra logic systems, um, you know, for power manipulation, control, data storage, and other complicated tasks. We're able to shrink things down from very large scale computing systems to much smaller um, computing systems. And the numerically controlled machine system, um, using those punch cards, as we've talked about earlier, or ma magnetic tape, so think like a VHS or a cassette if you, if you know of those older technologies. Um, they're allowed to create position and sequence information and allow for the control of motions and actions by the machine itself. Through auto and this automation would prove to be very useful um, moving forward into the 70s and 80s. Um, but of course, you know, we're still in robotic infancy as most people would see it from a modern standpoint but we had some very creative individuals um, at Waza in University from 1970 to 73 we created the Wabot 1 a robot that was designed and created to be the very first anthropomorphic um, robot which is you know a robot that has human um, features uh, different than the um, automata and uh, automatons um, in the fact that they're going to have, they're going to be much more complex um, with their actuation systems and interaction with the world around them. Um, and then in the 1980s, uh, you have the um, ASEA system, um, which is basically the industrial uh, arms that you see now very prevalently um, that are created to uh, work in manufacturing environments. In the 1980s, you know, manufacturing started to invest in robotics as they realized the value of the systems, um, leading to a greater demand for robots. And increased demand inspired smaller businesses to spring up to try their hand at creating these robots and creating um, robot manufacturing systems that we now see as um, necessities for our uh, way of life. The 1990s, some really interesting things happened. Um, Epson created in 1993 a robot that was smaller than a cubic centimeter, um, but still had over 80 parts and was able to walk or climb up an incline and move around. Um, and this is seen as one of the very first uh, nanotechnology components moving forward. And then Campbell Arid in 1998, uh, he, he was the first person to have a bionic arm prosthetic or robotic arm designed to mimic a human arm. And in this case, it was controlled by his nerve impulses. Um, so it was surgically attached. Um, and this advancement has taken has gone leaps and bounds since that 1998. Um, we're not quite to 20 years, and these systems have advanced uh, tremendously since then. But it was a it was a cutting cutting edge technology at the time, and it should be recognized.
All right, this millennium. So we're almost there to the end of this conversation or here, I don't know. Um, Dr. Hod Lipson in 2005 created robotic systems that could replicate themselves. So given enough parts, the robots could recreate themselves and those robots could recreate themselves. So we've now got robots that can um, build themselves and recreate themselves um, successfully um, given the materials. So uh, we've now gone into a point where from a manufacturing standpoint, the robots could in theory create themselves over and over again and then utilize that technology to do other things. And then in Baxter in 2012, which we've seen in class and other representations, um, Baxter is interesting because it was created by Rethink. And Baxter has that human torso capability, um, that tablet face, uh, which is also an interfacing control system. He has sensors and he can move around. Um, and then there are, is a small amount of AI software that helps to make the robot safe and easy to use. And it's able to do small tasks and continue to do so for over 24 hours. Um, so it can outperform most humans at rudimentary tasks. Uh, maybe not in speed, but in not getting tired or taking breaks. All right. So in conclusion, you should understand some key events that led to the invention of the modern robot. And of course, the evolution of the modern robot as we see it, we're starting to sink our teeth into what that conversation is. Um, but you now have an understanding of what it took to get to this point. Um, I hope you understand more about the events that led up to modern robotics and why they're important. Um, understanding that math and science and engineering um, and technology have lent themselves to get to this point and it's a unique robotics is a unique mesh of those stem principles um, there's a lot of information out there i encourage you to go out there and investigate more of these uh, pieces i will caution you that there's a lot of information out there that isn't necessarily true um, so definitely uh, take your time when you're going through that um, and find source materials that are from rep reputable places um, and good luck with that. Uh, on the next piece, we will be talking about exactly what is a robot in uh, History of Robotics Part 2.